Uh, tonight we'll be in Ezekiel chapter 21. Ezekiel chapter 21. Um, this is a long chapter. We're going to get through the whole chapter, so we have quite a bit to cover. 32 verses. Some of it I'll try to go kind of fast, but we'll get the general theme uh, before we get into Ezekiel 21. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that you have brought us together to worship you and get into your word, and I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, God. We, we came here to encounter your love, uh, Lord, to encounter your spirit, to uh, uh, remind um, ourselves of who you are and who we aren't, God. And I pray that you would speak to us through this passage. Uh, as you continue to speak a lot of judgment, uh, God, we know that there are things that you want to uh, want us to pull from this text. So I pray, uh, Lord, we would apply these things to our lives and help us to discern. Uh, maybe there's something you're speaking uh, to our hearts for this season that we're experiencing. Maybe uh, it's to remind us of a season that we have experienced or something that uh, you're preparing us for in the future, God. So I pray we would have ears to hear and eyes to see what you want to speak and do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Ezekiel chapter 20, we broke it up into two sections, uh, but generally uh, what uh, God was doing there was giving the elders a history of the Israelites' rebellion and reminding the elders that God has had a history of mercy towards them. It was this vicious cycle. The people would fall into idolatry. They would commit all these sins. They would cry out to God. God would deliver them. Uh, they'd get complacent in their spiritual walk. They'd go back to these idols and God would judge them and then they'd cry out. It's this vicious cycle and we see a lot of that cycle in the book of Judges. But that really is the history of Israel. Israel before the Babylonian exile. So essentially, God told the elders, uh, I, I'm not going to be inquired of by you. I'm not going to listen to you uh, because you're not listening to me. This is what the pattern of your history has been. This pattern continues, so now you're going to be judged. Ezekiel 21, we see uh, more scripture about judgment, but in this specific chapter, Ezekiel is going to focus on the sword of the Lord. God is going to bring his sword against Israel and judge them through the Babylonian captivity. The title of this teaching is the sword of the Lord. The sword of of the Lord. Now, the sword of the Lord is used in different ways in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We see in the New Testament, the Word of God is likened to as the sword of the Lord or the sword of God. We see references like Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Uh, it says the Word of God is, is living and powerful and sharper than, in, than a two-edged sword. God speaks His Word to, to pierce our hearts. And, and that's what Jesus came to do. He, he came to this earth with the sword of the Lord to speak the Word to people, to pierce the hearts of people that they would respond to the Gospel of grace and be saved. And, and that's how Jesus speaks to us today through the sword of His mouth through the Word of God and He wants us to hear Him. Uh, trying to hear from the Lord is not like a, a, a crazy thing to ask. He wants us to ask Him to speak to us. In John chapter 10 verses 26 to 27, Jesus said Himself, My sheep, they hear My voice and they follow Me. But we should be hearing from the Lord. And not maybe audibly. I've never heard from the Lord audibly, but, but He speaks to me through the Word. He warns me. He encourages me. He challenges me. And, and Jesus, He wants to speak to us through the sword of the Lord, which is the Word of God. And Jesus, He came with the sword of the Lord. He, he came with the Word of God in His first coming. And He's going to come again at His second coming, and He's going to bring a different type of sword. Yes, He's going to bring a sword. He's going to speak. But this is a sword of judgment. This too is the sword of the Lord. And we see in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes and stands on the Mount of Olives, He's going to bring a sword. And that sword's going to come out of His mouth. And He's going to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then that angel is going to chain Satan in hell for that thousand-year millennial 
will reign. So we see the sword of the Lord used different in different ways. It's used as a form of communication. It's also used as a form of judgment. And sometimes it can use, be used in both ways as a form of communication and judgment. Specifically in Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel uses this word sword, which is uh, harab in the Hebrew. Harab. Uh, he uses the word sword 89 times in the book of Ezekiel. And, and when Ezekiel is using this word, the sword of the Lord, he's using it in different ways. The main way he's using it is, is, is as if it's a tool for judgment. Uh, a tool for judgment. But the sword of the Lord can also mean uh, in Ezekiel just a general reference for war. Okay, We'll see it used as a tool here in Ezekiel chapter 21. Let's look at the first few verses. Ezekiel 21, verses 1 to 3. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem, preach against the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel, and say to the land of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath, cut off both righteous and wicked from you. So this is a message specifically for Jerusalem. Remember, Ezekiel is a prophet who's a captive in Babylon. His goal is to preach to the captives, the Israelite captives there in Babylon. But God will give him messages for Jerusalem. He'll give him messages for Babylon, for different places. But his primary ministry is to the captives. In this text, he's saying, preach against Jerusalem. Not just the people, uh, but also the place, the land. And he also says here to preach against the holy places, specifically speaking against the temple. God is going to use the sword of the Lord to destroy Solomon's temple. That's point number one. The sword of the Lord cleanses the temple. The sword of the Lord cleanses the temple. We see this in the Old Testament. We certainly see it in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the temple was, was a building, right? It was a building that people would come to and worship. If they couldn't get to the temple, they would go to a synagogue. But it was mandatory in Israel for every male to come up to the temple uh, for three specific feasts. The, the temple was uh, an amazing building that was built by Solomon, glorious. Uh, and then it was destroyed. And later on, Zerubbabel built the next temple. And, and then Herod did upgrades on that. And that was referred to as Herod. Herod's temple, that was the second temple, was destroyed in 70 AD. Uh, this is Solomon's temple that's going to be destroyed. Whereas in the Old Testament, the temple was a building. In the New Testament, the Bible says we're the building. We're the temple. The, Bi the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How, how many of us say, my body? Right? I can do with, with my body what I want. I can eat what I want. I can drink what I want. I can watch what I want. I can listen to what It's my body. How often do we say, this is the Lord's body, right? But we don't think like that often. But our body, the Bible says, no, wait, hey, when you sign the... When you answer that altar call, you signed your body over to Jesus. Like, do you realize the commitment that you made there? You don't even own your body anymore. Like, you gave it to him. So, so what you do with your body, it really isn't your decision to make. It's not my decision to make. It's what does the Lord want to do with my body? And then when we start misusing our body, and we start putting things in our body that, that we shouldn't be putting in our body, whether it's drugs or alcohol or even bad habits, food, too much sugar, whatever the case may be, the, the, the temple starts, starts crumbling, right? Uh, but when it gets to things that are, are pretty severe, and we start misusing our temple in, in various ways, God goes, no, uh that ain't your temple. That's my temple. And, and I'm not going to let you get away with defiling my temple like that. 
And and this was the lesson in John chapter 2. This is what Jesus did. The people were misusing the temple of God. Uh, The people were taking advantage of the people. Uh, They would come with a a sheep or a a goat to provide a a sacrifice, say, on on Passover. And they would say, no, 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 that that sheep or goat is blemished. We're going to charge you four times uh, the amount of the sheep that you bought. And you've got to buy ours. So... So, so that you can provide the sacrifice to God. And they were using the temple as a business. And Jesus said, not uh, not my dad's house. That ain't happening. So he took a whip and he drove him out and, and he cleansed the temple. Uh, Jesus wasn't just cleansing their temple or his temple, really, because they were misusing it. It, it was a lesson for all of us that, that when we misuse God's temple, we're asking Jesus to come in with a whip and cleanse us. That cleansing process... It, It doesn't always feel good. It often hurts. And sometimes he does that through trials, through tribulations. We'll get into all of that. But there was another reason why Jesus cleansed the temple. The temple was being misused. The first time, he cleansed it in John chapter 2. Then he comes back in John chapter 7, and he teaches in it, right? He wants to cleanse our temple so that he can teach us. So, so that we can hear them more clearly. And when we're defiling our temple, our ears are getting clogged, our eyes are getting foggy, we can't see, we can't hear. So he clears it all out so we can hear the still small voice because he wants his sheep to hear his voice. And, and then when we're cleansed, we'll just keep hearing them more and more and more. Why? Because he's a good groom. And a good groom washes his bride with the water of the word. That's what it says in Ephesians 5.26. That's what Jesus does to his groom. He just keeps washing us. Once we're cleansed, he's like, you can't be too clean for me. I'm going to keep washing you with the water of the word. But, but you're not going to sense that cleansing if you keep defiling the temple. You're not going to hear as clearly. You're not going to get as much out of your devotions, out of teachings, out of the Word of God in general if the temple is defiled. So he's going to cleanse the holy place. He's going to cleanse the people. He's going to cleanse the land. He's going to cleanse it by judging all of it. And he says, I am against you in verse 3, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Nobody escapes the sword of the Lord. He says, I'm going to cut off both righteous and wicked. And then we go, wait, wait, what about Ezekiel 18? He says, says that, the, the, that, that the children aren't going to suffer for the father's sins. What, how do we put these things together? Okay, He says all the people are going to get judged temporally. Like in the now, in moments, uh, physically, they're going to face physical suffering, but... The soul who sins shall die. That's what he said in Ezekiel chapter 18. And the soul who follows God and keeps his commandments, that that soul shall live. So there are going to be some righteous people who die through the Babylonian exile. There's going to be prophets that die through all of this. But God's going to deliver the righteous eternally. So the sword is going to wipe out the nation almost completely. Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 4. Because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword shall go out of its sheath against all flesh from south to north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return anymore. So he's doing this. He's cutting off Israel, and all the other nations are going to see this happen. The the onlooking nations are going to look at what God does to Israel, and their minds are going to be blown. See, See, God is going to be glorified whether we choose a life of righteousness or a life of wickedness. He's going to use our lives to teach someone a lesson. And it could be a a way to teach someone a a positive lesson or a a way to teach someone a a negative lesson. He wanted to use Israel as a light to the Gentiles, to to show the Gentiles this is the way to live. (laughs) You follow the Lord's commandments, it's going to be well with you and your children and your livestock, all of that. But you disobey the Lord and and punishment is coming. So this was a lesson for the surrounding nations of what happens when you're in a relationship or a covenant with God and you break the covenant. Either way, God's going to get a message across. Ezekiel 21 Verse 6, sigh therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. He tells them to sigh with a broken heart 
and with bitterness. Uh, God doesn't want Ezekiel to be indifferent about this. He, he doesn't want Ezekiel to have a hard heart. He doesn't want Ezekiel to, to not have emotions attached to his message. He wants them to be emotional. He wants his heart to break for these people. Why? Because God's heart is breaking for these people. If he's not preaching with a broken heart, then he's misrepresenting the one who's actually given the message. So he says, I want your heart to break and sigh and weep. This breaking of the heart literally means breaking of the loins. Uh, the, the loins in the Hebrew mindset was thought to be uh, the center of physical and emotional strength. The loins, that's the heart in, in Hebrew. It's not this, it's, it's in your loins. So that's the center of their physical and emotional strength. So if your loins are broken, that means you are completely broken and weak physically and emotionally. There, there's nothing you can do. You're a complete mess. You're, you're completely broken. And this is how God wanted Ezekiel to preach this message. See, God, He, he wants our, our heart to break for what breaks His. We sing songs about this. We, we talk about it. But sometimes we can become indifferent to, to different things. Indifferent to people who continue to live a, a sinful lifestyle. Indifferent to uh, the horrendous things that are going on in the world. We see it on the news every single day that it's just like, uh, yeah, I hear it all the time. These things are always happening. Kids are getting uh, uh, molested. Uh, abortions are happening. People are getting murdered. It's like, yeah, you know, it's just what it is. Uh, but God doesn't want us to just have that heart. It is what it is. He, he doesn't want us to be indifferent about these things. He wants our heart to continue to break for these things. Our hearts should break for, for people who continue in sin and, and live destructive lifestyles. Our heart should break for, for kids who are, are being tormented and mistreated and, and all these horrific things that are going on in our lives. Like uh, We get desensitized to it in many ways. And God says, no, no, no. Keep your heart soft. A soft heart is a heart that God can use. And though God had given Ezekiel all these really terrible messages to deliver, he wants them to maintain that softness of heart. So he continues, he says, And it shall be when they say to you, Why are you sighing that you shall answer? Because of the news, when it comes, every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, every spirit will faint, and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming, and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord. As he's sighing and weeping, and his heart is breaking, the people are going to ask, uh, why are you sighing? Why, why are you weeping? He says, because of the news. Tell him because of the news. Because God gave me news that all of you gonna, are going to be wiped out. You're all going to be wiped out. And, and those that don't repent, they're not going back to the promised land. And if you don't raise your children in the ways of the Lord, you're not going to back to the promised land. But right now, everyone we know back home, man, many of them are going to die. Our, our country is going to be destroyed. Our city is going to be destroyed. This is why I'm signed. Because this is what God told me. And this is what's going to happen. Imagine, like, God told you, hey, listen, uh, I'm judging the United States of America, and m m most of your family members aren't going to survive. Whether they're believers or not, they, they, they were just, it, I've had it. it. The sword of the Lord's coming, I'm wiping out your entire nation. Like, that, that's some heavy stuff. You might survive, you might not. Whether you, you know the Lord or not, we know where we're going, but still that doesn't mean the judgment's going to be easy. And this is what God is telling Ezekiel, and this is what Ezekiel's telling him. You understand, mom and dad are back in, in Jerusalem in, in Babylon is coming. God, God has had enough. He's taking the message seriously. And he's telling them that this news is bound to happen. And this is why God says here, he says, Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord. This is coming. It's, it's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when. And it's right around the corner. And, and when these people, these people who have rejected uh, the, the people in Jerusalem have rejected the messages of, of Jeremiah. Uh, the people in Babylon have rejected the messages of Ezekiel. They, they don't believe it, and they won't believe it until they see it. When they see it, their knees are going to be feeble. 
it literally says in the Hebrew that they're going to pee their pants when it happens. Like, they're going to be so scared that the water is just going to flow. They're going to be terrified, but they will not believe the word of God that they hear until they see it. And when they see it, it's going to be too late. That's the sad reality for many people in our day and age. The news is there. The news is real, but they don't believe it. They'll believe it when they see it, but when they see it, for many, it's going to be too late. So how often are we sighing and weeping and mourning and going to people, hey, listen, like, this is what's going to happen. And even if it happens in our lifetime, hey, listen, like, there's a way out. There's grace. Jesus came. He died on a cross for our sins so that you could be forgiven. I could be forgiven. If we put our trust in him and have a relationship with him, we can be saved and have a complete turnaround in our life. I wonder when God might just say, Judgment is coming to America. But we won't, many won't believe the news until they see the news play out in their lives. So he goes on and he says here in verse 8, Again, the, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished, sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Should we then make mirth, it despises the scepter of my son as it does all wood. So God says, hey, the sword is sharpened, it's polished. Okay, this is kind of common sense, but this is what they would do before battle. They would sharpen and polish their swords. These swords are ready. God says, uh, my sword is ready. Like, that means like, we're not talking about decades from now. We're like talking about this judgment is right around the corner. You don't sharpen and polish a sword unless you're ready to use it. That's what God is saying. I'm prepared to judge my people. And then Ezekiel uh, poses this question through the Lord. It says, should we then make mirth? Uh, mirth means to rejoice. It's like a sarcastic question. Uh, what he's saying, the idea here, is, is, there is there is nothing to rejoice over during this time period. There is nothing to be happy about during this time period. And he says, should we, it despises the scepter of my son as it does all wood. The son here is likely uh, referring to Zedekiah, who was the king during this time period before, before that final siege. And what God is saying is that he's going to use the sword to cut off the scepter. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. The scepter referring to the scepter of Judah, the line of Judah, uh, the lineage of kings that started with King David. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 11 and he has given it to be polished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it is polished to be given into the hand of the slayer. So who's the slayer? That's the king of Babylon, okay? Or you could say Babylon as a whole, but specifically the king. This sword of judgment um, is of the Lord, but he's going to, in a sense, hand this sword to Babylon to execute his judgment, okay? It says here in verse 12, Cry and wail, son of man, for it will be against my people, against all the princes of Israel. Terrors, including the sword, will be against my people. Therefore, strike your thigh. He says, cry and wail, because it's against all my people, your friends, your family, your Sunday school teacher, all of them. This is against all of them. So cry and wail. God again calls Ezekiel to cry and wail because he's crying and he's wailing and he's weeping. This isn't something that God is, is taking pleasure in. This is something that, that breaks God's heart. But because he's holy and just, he can't just let people just continue living like this. So his hand is forced to judge Israel. He wish it would have gone a different way and because it couldn't, he, he weeps. This is the same response that we see in the Lord Jesus just before he was crucified as he was looking on over at Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, 
Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus' heart heart is breaking. So now, then he gets into the next temple that's going to be destroyed because they rejected God again. So, so they reject God. God takes them through the 70-year Babylonian exile so that they come back a purified people. They start off on the right track, but then they make religion their God and to kind of push God out of the equation that now they're worshiping the temple and their religious practices and man-made laws are trumping God's laws and you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and again, and now I got, I got to do it all over again. I got to do it again and again and again. And I'll continue to do it again and again and again. These trials and tribulations until we learn our lesson. God would rather it be a different way. But sadly, this was the only way. The text continues here. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 13. Look what he says. Because it is a testing. And what if the sword despises even the scepter? The scepter shall be no more. He says this sword of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, God is using to test the people. That's point number two. The sword of the Lord is used to test us. The sword of the Lord is used to test us. Now, we talked about the sword of the Lord, you know, uh, speaking of the word of God, we see in this text, God is using this phrase, the sword of the Lord, uh, as a way to communicate judgment, okay? So we know as children of God, we're not subjected to, to wrath or condemnation. However, we are subjected to the discipline of our Father. And just as God knew the Israelites needed to go through this Babylonian exile and be taken from the land and suffer these serious consequences to learn their lesson, so too does God, as a good father does and should. He takes us through our own Babylonian exile sometimes in our life, our own trials and tribulations to teach us lessons that we couldn't learn otherwise. James says it like this, in James 1, 2 to 4, in James 1, 2 to 4, he says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Sometimes we fall into trials and sometimes we jump into them. Sometimes we dive right into them. We just think, ah, you know... I really want to do this. Like, I know God doesn't want me to do it, but I really want to do it. And I really want to go this route. And I really want to have this relationship. And I really want to live in this location. I really want to have this job. I really want to continue this sinful habit. And God says, okay, I'll let you go so far. And then we get whapped with our own type of Babylonian exile. This, this trial that we bring into our lives that God uses to, to change us, to redirect us, to purify us. Sometimes we bring the trials, sometimes the trials just happen, but regardless, whether we bring them, we fall into them, or we jump into them, trials are a part of the Christian life. It's a part of the Christian life. Testing is a part of our life. That God is testing us daily. God is testing us daily. When the, season, the seasons where everything seems great, seasons where things seem rough, you're, you're getting tested both ways. How do we deal with the seasons of blessing? How do we deal with the seasons of brutality? It's all tests. And we can only make it to the next stage in our Christian walk if we pass the test. Otherwise, we just keep going in circles and circles. That's what the Israelites were doing and still are doing today. It's been thousands of years. They're still caught up in religiosity. Some have been saved, many haven't. And the sad truth is that cycle is not going to change for many until Jesus comes back again. Well, what about us? What are those vicious cycles we keep finding ourselves in? What grade are you in spiritually? You first, second, third? How long have you been walking with the Lord? And how far along have you come in your faith? You got to college yet? Have you graduated? None of us will ever get there, right? I don't know what the final thing is. Get your PhD in Christianity? I don't know. First grade, second grade, third grade? How long have you been in first grade? How many years? Are we going to just keep going through the same things over and over and over? Because God, God, God's got all day. He's got all, all eternity. Just waiting for us to pass the test so we can go to the next grade. Guess what happens when we go to the next grade? 
harder tests. There's more fruit. There's more character. There's more joy to be had, more love, more peace. So he says, what if the sword despises the scepter? The scepter shall be no more. So people are like, what? You can't take out the line of the, the, the kings of Judah. You can't just, that was a promise that you made. What, what if the sword despises the scepter? Well, the sword does despise the scepter at this point. Because there hasn't been a righteous king in a while. And it's Zedekiah right now. And he certainly isn't righteous. He rebels against King Bible. The, the sword despises the scepter and he's going to cut off the lineage of Judah until Jesus comes on the scene and establishes his eternal kingdom because he's of the line of Judah, of the line of David. Ezekiel 21, 14. You therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The t third time, let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays, the great men that enter their private chambers. So he tells Ezekiel, this is the th third time and let the sword do double damage. So uh, the Babylonians have come twice already. Nebuchadnezzar, he came in uh, 605 B.C. That's when he took Daniel and then the cream of the crop people. Uh, then he came again in 597 B.C. That's when he got Ezekiel. And the people kept rebelling against Neb. And finally, God sends uh, Nebuchadnezzar one more time in 587 B.C. And this is the third time. The third time he's going to do double the damage. This is where he destroys the temple and the city as a whole. Ezekiel 21.15. I have set the points of the sword against all their gates, that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasped for slaughter. Swords at the ready. Thrust right. Set your blade. Thrust left. Wherever your edge is ordered. Now God is speaking like a general for the battle. He's telling those soldiers, Get your swords ready. Strike right, strike left. Whatever you see, just cut that person down. Cut that thing down. Like God is playing general in this moment. He goes on to say in verse 7, I, I also will beat my fist together and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, And son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Both of them shall go from the same land, make a sign, put it at the head of the road to the city. So uh, God explains that the king of Babylon is at this point geographically. Uh, and, and Ezekiel, uh, he calls Ezekiel to, to, to basically make some kind of, of map that, that goes two directions. And he wants them to make this, this sign that points two different directions. We see this in verse 20. Appoint a road for the sword to go to Rabbah of the Ammonites and to Judah and to fortify Jerusalem. So he's at this finite point. Uh, many scholars believe he was actually in Damascus. So he's either going to go to Rabbah or he's going to go to Jerusalem. Now this sign would have, in the Hebrew it says, this sign is literally has, uh, is engraved with the hand and fingers pointing to the direction that he's supposed to go first. Okay, and we'll see which direction that is. Picking it up in verse 21. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road, at the fork of the two roads, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the images, he looks at the liver. Uh, so so the, the king of Babylon, he's using various pagan methods to try to understand right or left. So one method was they would shake the arrows. They would take two arrows. One would have one inscription, you know, this way, and the other one would have the other one, this inscription. And uh, I don't really know how they do it. They don't explain it. Maybe they toss them up in the air and they close their eyes and pick one. I don't really know. Maybe they just pull it out of the sheet. This is the one. So we go this direction. Okay. Uh, they would also uh, consult images. Now, this usually had to do with some type of idol um, and uh, some type of, of priest or false prophet that would consult this image and then uh, the prophet would tell him go right or left. And lastly, this one's weird. Uh, they actually um, would use this process uh, uh, of slaughtering animals. Uh, then they would take the liver of the animals uh, and the different segments of the livers and they'd uh, look at the coloration and different things to determine right or left. 
uh, and, and other things. So, so he's using these, these pagan rituals to try to understand, do I go to Rabbah or do I go to Jerusalem? And he's, and he's doing all kinds of stuff to make sure he goes in the right direction. At least he's a, a dedicated man, right? But, but we know that, that God is actually behind the scenes, uh, even working through these uh, false forms of divination to point the king in the right direction. That doesn't mean you should try to use these forms of divination and, and, and God will use it to point you to the way. We're not supposed to use this, but God would actually use it in this particular situation. Ezekiel 21 verse 22, it says, In his right hand is the divination for Jerusalem to set up battering rams, to call for a slaughter, to lift the voice with shouting, to set battering, battering rams against the gates, to heap up a siege mound, and to build a wall. So God, you know, used these false rituals to point Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem first before he went to Rabbah of the Amorites. And he even discusses how God was going to take over or how um, God was going to use Nebuchadnezzar to wipe out Jerusalem. Now, if you had a, a, an army that was comparable to the other army, you would just, you know, um, fight in the Valley of Megiddo or something like, let's get it on. But but Jerusalem, they know that they have no chance against Babylon, so their best, their best way to experience victory is to just hide in Jerusalem. It's very well walled, uh, so to speak, uh, and hope that the Babylonians just starve to death. We know that's not going to happen. So uh, the Babylonians, they would use battering rams to knock out gates. They would lay siege to go over uh, some of the walls, and this is how ultimately they would destroy Jerusalem very quickly. Ezekiel, in a matter of months, they destroyed Jerusalem. Ezekiel 21, verse 23. And it will be to them like a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths with them, but he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may be taken. So, um, it says here that uh, he's going to bring their iniquity to remembrance. So, because God, or Judah, forgot about God, they chose not to remember God, God is going to remember their sins. They, they didn't repent. They didn't ask God for forgiveness. They just took, totally forgot about God. So God is going to remember their sins. And it says here, in that your transgressions are uncovered, so that in all your doings, your sins appear, because you have come to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. So God, he's going to use the sword of judgment to uncover and expose the sins of Israel. This is point number three. The sword of the Lord exposes our sins. The sword of the Lord exposes our sins. Now, again... Yeah, this can be used both ways. The Word of God exposes our sins. Like, God speaks to us through the Word. And I encourage you, like, if you don't know what your sins are, ask someone close to you. Uh, or uh, ask the Lord to reveal it to you through the Word. As He says in Psalm 139, uh, 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And, and see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I pray that prayer sometimes, but not all the times. Because when I pray it, some ugly stuff comes out, and I'm like just defeated for like a week. And I like, I can't do anything anymore. I failed as a husband and a father and a pastor. It's like I'm good for nothing. So, but as much as you can handle it. But we need to do this, right? We need to understand what our sins are. Uh, and if we don't choose to try to seek God out and figure that out with Him, he, he's, he's going to bring him to the surface eventually. So, so we can listen to the Word of God and allow Him to expose our sins and in our one-on-one -on -one time with him, or we can just keep shutting our, our, our ears, and then he brings the other sword, the, the sword of judgment, or, or the sword of discipline, and he just, Poof. all right, you, you didn't want to expose this, so, so I am. We see in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. God says, hey, expose that stuff. Get it out, man. Get it out. Because if it just sits there, it ain't going away. If there's something that you're struggling with that you haven't been able to get over and like you've tried, you're struggling, you keep, 
is talk to someone. Expose yourself. Talk to someone you trust and say, hey, I'm battling with this thing. Can, can, can you pray with me? Like, I'm confessing it to you. And I need, I want some accountability to, to overcome this area of my life because there are unfruitful works of darkness in my heart and I just don't want them there anymore because they won't just go away by just brushing them under the rug and pretend like they're not there. So, so God gives us a choice. He says, hey, you can expose them or I'll expose them. It's one or the other because I love you and I, I don't want you to continue on this way. The Israelites, they wouldn't uncover themselves. So God had to uncover them. He says in Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 25, Now to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Okay, now he's definitely speaking to Zedekiah. Okay, Zedekiah is often referred to as a prince in the book of Ezekiel. He's in the place of king, but uh, Ezekiel doesn't recognize Zedekiah as the rightful king. He recognizes Jehoiachin as the rightful king who's a captive in Babylon. So he refers to him as a prince. And he says, your time of judgment has come. Verse 26. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. So he says, take off the tur uh, remove the turban, take off the crown. Uh, God would humble Zedekiah. He would remove his crown. He would... Nebuchadnezzar, would, the last thing he would see, so Zedekiah flees his people in the midst of battle. He tries to run away. And the last thing he sees is his son's killed before his eyes. Then his eyes are plucked out and he's taken off to Babylon all because he rebelled against the Lord. Tragic end to a tragic reign. But he also says remove the turban. That was a priestly uh, garment. And, and he, he's saying that not only the king will be taken away, the, the, the priest uh, will be removed from office as well. He says, nothing shall remain the same. God says, you guys are doing the opposite of what I wanted you to do. Nothing's going to remain the same. God says, I'm going to turn your world right side up or, or upside down, however you think of it, but I'm intervening because something needs to change. So point number four, the sword of, sword of the Lord inspires change. The sword of the Lord inspires change. Sometimes, in order for us to change, something externally needs to change. Sometimes, when we refuse to change, God is determined to change us. When we refuse to change, God brings different things into our life to push us to change, to inspire change in our life. Sometimes he changes, he calls us to a different location. Sometimes he calls us to a different career path. Uh, sometimes he calls us to a, a different group, a, a different setting. Sometimes he takes things from us. Sometimes he allows us to be inflict, uh, inflicted uh, uh, emotionally or, or physically. God can do all kinds of things in our life, externally, internally, to push us towards change. Sword of the Lord, he loves us. He, he, he's a good father. He cares for us. But he is determined to change us. And we push back when we push back and we wrestle against God like Israel did, like Jacob did. We wrestle against God year after year after year. That never ends well. God's going to change us one way or another. We can choose to, to allow the change to take place and, and walk away on, on our own two feet or we can keep wrestling with God and end up having to walk away with a painful limp for the rest of our lives because we refuse to change. That's what happened with Israel. Jacob, you wouldn't change. God says, you're not winning this battle. One way or another, you're going to change, bud. We keep wrestling the rest of your life, but it's going to happen. God's determined to change us. He says, exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Now, this is uh, difficult to understand. Um, you, you know, we know that he's humbling Zedekiah. He's humbling the people that are in leadership. Uh, but who are the humble that he's exalting? Uh, well, we know that only peasants and poor people will remain in Jerusalem from this point forward. Uh, but not all of them are righteous. Some of them are going to be judged as well. Um, uh, this could also uh, be referring to the exaltation of Jehoiachin, 
Okay, so Jehoiachin was taken as a, as a captive, as a king in 597 BC with, the, with Ezekiel. Um, and he was only reigned for like three months and ten days. Uh, but there in prison, uh, he was actually put uh, in a high position and, and taken care of as far as a you know, king prisoner goes. We see reference of this in 2 Kings chapter 25. In 2 Kings chapter 25. Verse 27, it says, Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 12, uh, 27th day of the month, that evil uh, Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments and he ate bread uh, regularly before the king all the days of his life. So he's released as a prisoner. He's put in this good situation. Some think that maybe that's what's happening. The, the rightful king, he's going to get taken care of in the end. E either way, we know that this is, this is a, a very important theme throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. God wants humble people. He wants humble people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, Proverbs 16, verse 18, he says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He says pride goes before destruction. That's a, that's a promise, meaning like if we continue with pride, it's going to destroy us. I don't think I need to elaborate on that. That just makes perfect sense, right? So we choose to either humble ourselves or allow God to destroy us with the, with the pride. With the pride continues. Like, and I've had this many times in my life where... I knew that the pride was creeping up and I just continued in my pride and God just wrecked my day and wrecked my life and just put me back in my place. And, and I remember one time I asked God, God, humble me. I'll never pray it again. I'll never pray it again. God wrecked my world, like completely wrecked my world. I can't get into, the, into any details, but he completely wrecked my world. Like one of the worst experiences I ever had in my entire life. Like where I was like, oh my gosh, is this what it means to be a Christian? I don't know. I don't know if I could do this anymore. But it produced humility in me, that's for sure. I came out of that a different person. And there have been other situations where God has had to do that to me. Uh, other times, the pride creeps up. The, the, the pride is like that snake that just raises its ugly head. You got to cut that snake's head off. You got to put it to death. You need to kill that thing before it destroys you. Our pride will destroy us. That's why God says, be be humble. Be humble. So, and this is what I pray now. God, give me opportunities to walk in humility. That's the new prayer. Give me opportunities to walk in humility because that's different. Now I get the choice, right? I get to choose the, the, the humble path. I'll never pray that God humble me prayer ever again. But God wants humble people. He can work with humble people. Prideful people, they think they, they, they did something to get where they're at. That's why I was Zedekiah. That was the princes of the day, prideful people always boasting, always talking about how good they are, always trying to, to, to one-up people. And there's a lot of insecurity when it comes to, to, to pride and, and arrogance. Humble people, they, they got, they're confident. Humble people are confident. It, it's, they don't have to say anything. They don't have to boast. They don't have to seek power and prestige and prominence for the wrong reasons. He goes on, he says, we're almost there. Ezekiel 21, verse 27. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. So God had to destroy the city. He had to destroy the people. He had to destroy the building. Why? So he could rebuild it. He couldn't rebuild it the way that it was. He had to start from scratch. And so often, this is what God has to do in our lives. Sometimes we're building our own kingdom on this earth. Sometimes we're building our own lives. 
you know, we go through the routine and we pray our prayers and we read our Bible and we come to church, but we're kind of like really doing our own thing. You know, we say, yeah, God, your will be done, but we really want our will to be done. We're building this kingdom and sometimes God's got to just wreck that and demo it and destroy it. Why? So he can, he can build something new. He can build what, what he wants to build, not what, what we want to build. So, so sometimes it starts from scratch and sometimes it's not our whole lives. Sometimes it's just certain areas of our life. Hey, this needs to get demoed. This place of your heart needs to get destroyed so I, so I can build it back up. See, we must be broken before we can be fixed. We have to be broken before we can be fixed. The nation of Israel, they had to be broken so God could rebuild a holy people. And he says, until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. This is a prophecy, obviously, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus. The Davidic line would be cut off until Jesus came on the scene to restore the people, to preach the gospel, to offer an eternal kingdom that never perishes. But they rejected it. They rejected him at his first coming. But the remnant of Israel who survives the tribulation will accept him at his second coming. Ezekiel 21 will just blow uh, right through this um, prophecy against the Ammonites. And you, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach, and say, A sword, a sword is drawn, polished for slaughter, for consuming, for flashing, while they see false visions for you, while they divine a lie to you, to bring you on the necks of the wicked, the slain, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Return to its sheath. I will judge you in the place where you were created, in the land of your nativity. I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skillful to destroy. You shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land. You shall not be remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Now remember, there was that fork in the road, right? It was Rabbah of the Ammonites and Jerusalem. God said, go to Jerusalem first, and then Nebuchadnezzar would go to Rabbah. So the, historically, we can account for this. Uh, in 587, uh, Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem. It was destroyed by 586 B.C., just in a few months. And, and then in 581 B.C., five years later, Nebuchadnezzar went to Rabbah and destroyed the Ammonites. But God says their judgment, the Ammonites' judgment, is going to be worse than the Israelites. So much so, he says, you shall not be remembered. Okay? You're not going to be remembered. That, that was like the worst thing you could tell a nation. They wanted to be remembered forever. Okay, We don't understand this completely because their name is in the Word of God, and the Word of God lasts forever. But it's just like God's like, I'm going to, you think what I did to Jerusalem is bad. That's nothing compared to what I'm going to do to you. So God would destroy the Ammonites. Now, this is a, this is a very heavy passage uh, about the sword of the Lord. But I think as believers, uh, we can really grasp something from this. We know the sword of the Lord here is being used in the sense of a, of a weapon that's yielded uh, for judgment. But we also know that the sword of the Lord is also re referring to the word, the spoken word of God. Now as believers, I think we got a choice. God wants to speak to us through his word. He wants to speak to us through the sword of the Lord, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And he speaks through the word, through teachings, through devotions. The more we're in it, the more we're going to hear it. But we can be in it and hear it all the time and not really hear. We can see it all the time and not really see. And so when we quit listening and we quit looking, Sometimes we're asking for the other sword of the Lord, the sword of judgment, the sword of, of discipline. God wants us to have eyes to see and ears to hear. When the eyes close and the ears close, sword of judgment or discipline. God is not afraid to whip our behinds. He is not, and he will. And sometimes he asks you, sometimes that they won't listen. I get it with Jude. I hate spanking Jude. I hate it. He cries. Sometimes the only way he'll listen Sometimes the only way, the, the sword of the word, it's not working. So the sword of judgment, it's inevitable and it's a painful lesson. But those lessons are lessons that usually last a lifetime. Or at least they last a long time. The sword of the Lord is coming. Which sword are you going to respond to? 
the sword of the word? Or are you going to wait until God has to bring the sword of discipline? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the sword that you give us to speak to us, God, a living and powerful book. This is not just a, a history book or uh, a book of fables, but a book of, of, of truth. And there's history. But this book is living. And I pray we would see it like that, God, that we would purpose to tune in and listen to you, that we would pray for the Spirit to speak to us through this living book, God, and we would respond to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Lord, that we would not have to, to force ourselves to face the discipline that you inflict on us. And we know you're a good father, and sometimes we need to be disciplined. God, but I pray that we would take the easier way and just listen the first time, that we wouldn't have to get the whooping after we've rejected your word time and time again, Lord. So please put us on the right path. Help us respond to the test that you give us in this life with faithfulness and, and love and, and truth. So, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen.